Good How evening. Well, <laughs> I wish you could do it for me, one of you. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the LSE this evening, the Clickside Theatre. And I'm uh, delighted this evening to be chairing the official inaugural lecture uh, for our new chair uh, in the Middle East, Bawa Kerkes, who is uh, here with us this evening, who's going to talk, as you can see, about a broken Middle East, a wasted decade of war on terror. Uh, Fawaz has stepped into some very large shoes here at the school um, in that uh, he is the new Fred Halliday. Um, Fred, as you know, <laughs> uh, he's slightly smaller than Fred, um, uh, but um, uh, I'm sure is going to be just as big a figure in the school and particularly our relations with the Middle East uh, as Fred was, though that might take a year or two. Um, <laughs> but we were delighted to be able to attract Fawaz here from the States. He did an MSc uh, in the LSE a few years back, was at Oxford for his PhD, but then taught in the United States uh, for a number of years, where he held a chair in Middle Eastern Studies at Sarah Lawrence College in New York. Uh, he's written two uh, books recently, The Journey of the Jihadist Inside Muslim Militancy and The Far Enemy, Why Jihad Went Global, uh, and is currently writing a book uh, which, according to his website, is tentatively entitled The Making of the Arab World from Nasser to Nasrallah. He frequently appears in the global press. He writes particularly columns for uh, the CNN uh, website uh, and has been a very active media presence, particularly, of course, in the United States, where he has been until recently. So we were thrilled when he accepted our invitation to take over the chair in Middle Eastern Studies here. And as we do with distinguished new professors who come here, uh, we like to organize an inaugural lecture. We don't make them do it in precisely their first week. Uh, so he has been here for just over a term. So he's got his feet well under the table. I'm delighted to present our new Middle Eastern professor, Fawaz Gerges, to you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Uh, thank you for chairing this evening's um, event. I know we know how busy you are, so it's a treat. Thanks. Uh, first, I, I want to thank uh, my colleagues at the IR department um, and, of course, the chair, Christopher, for their uh, warm welcome. Uh, they have already really made me feel at home uh, at the LSC. Um, every time I complain about how hard I work, Christopher says, baptism by fire. That's the IR, the IR motto, and uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, a qualification uh, tonight. Um, I'm not going to talk about any particular uh, theoretical issues related to the study of the international relations of the Middle East. Uh, this is not about the study, the international relations uh, study uh, of the modern Middle East. We do it in the classrooms, in articles, in um, in books. Uh, what I want to do tonight is to put some ideas uh, on the table, uh, to take stock of where the Middle East uh, is today and why it has reached this particular desperate, broken uh, face. Because I argue, I will make the argument that the Middle East today is broken, uh, literally uh, broken. I also want to uh, spend some time on the impact of the so-called global war on terror, on internal and regional dynamics, uh, because I think there is a relationship between the deepening structural institutional crisis in the Middle East and the global war that has been uh, uh, waged by the United States and its allies uh, in the last uh, 10 years. Finally, I want to say a few words about uh, where to go from here. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, please remember. I will be simplifying a great deal tonight. I will be talking in terms of abstractions, and I hope during the answer and the question session, I'll be able to zero in on some of the critical uh, uh, substantive issues 
that I will be putting on the table uh, tonight. Let me start, as I said, with the subtitle of my talk. Uh, that is a wasted decade of the war on terror uh, in the Middle East. You might think this is a polemical question. This is a rhetorical question. Uh, it's not. I really don't intend it this way. I think it goes to the very heart uh, about some very faulty and misguided judgments made by Washington on about the nature of the threat faced by the United States and its allies uh, on the morning after 9-11. Uh, uh, those judgments have proved to be catastrophic. Those judgments made in the aftermath of 9-11 catastrophic to the region and also to Western interests in the region in the short term and the long term. And I want to say a few words uh, about those, uh, some of those uh, uh, repercussions on regional security and international uh, security. Let's take a look at the nature of the threat that faced the United States and the Western powers on the morning uh, after 9-11. The US and its allies faced a transnational group of dedicated and relentless and seasoned fighters between uh, 3,000 and 4,000 concentrated mainly in Afghanistan. And I am being very generous when I say three, between three and 4,000 uh, Al-Qaeda fighters at the height of its power in the late 1990s, Al-Qaeda never numbered more than three or 4,000 fighters. The rank and file of Al-Qaeda were concentrated in the Afghan uh, theater. They were not dispersed as they are today in multiple theaters. Contrary to received wisdom, contrary to the received wisdom, there has never been, there has never been a viable social base of the global jihad in the world of Islam. There has never been a viable, durable base of the global jihad in the Muslim world. Because this is what I'm saying, this is very critical to any analytical assessment of the threat faced by the United States and its allies after 9-11. Uh, Since its inception in the second part of the 20th century, the, what we call the militant Islamist or the jihadist current basically focus its energy on the near enemy, that is, uh, Muslim uh, leaders, as opposed to the far enemy, the United States and uh, its allies. Uh, as late as 1995, and remember this is just a recent phenomenon, as late as 1995, there existed not even a single document on the global jihad, on how, whether you need to wage a global war on the far enemy. United States and its allies. Every single document that existed between 1958, that is the birth of the movement, and 1995 was basically on the al-adu al qarib the near enemy. That is how the, the, the necessity to wage war against uh, Muslim, what they called renegade Muslim uh, rulers as opposed to the far enemy, the United States and its allies. As late as 1995, Ayman Zawahiri made it very clear that the road to Jerusalem goes through Cairo, Algiers, and Amman, not New York, Washington, and London. This is the same Ayman Zawahiri, who some of my colleagues basically cite to say that he is the conceptualizer of the global jihad. He has become the voice of the global jihad, in particular since 1996, 1998. In fact, I would argue, and I, I, I hope some of my colleagues basically take, take me to task, that Ayman Zawahiri is a global jihadist by default, by necessity, as opposed to a global jihadist by choice. By the mid-1990s, as you all know, between 1995 and 1997, the near Anabi jihadis, those who basically were waging a war against Muslim rulers, were strategically defeated on the battlefield in Egypt, in Algeria, and elsewhere. And most of them, by 1995, declared a unilateral ceasefire, a code word for surrender. They decided to shut the local jihad shop by 1997. Zawahiri's shift to the global jihad was, I would argue, was tactically designed to rescue the near enemy sinking jihadi ship that was really sinking by 1997. Um, in fact, by 1996, 
his al-Jihad faction. He led the so-called the Egyptian Islamic Jihad or al-Jihad faction, was starving for resources. Some of the people I was meeting in Cairo and Yemen basically did not really have the resources to pay the widows and the orphans of their killed fighters in Egypt and Afghanistan and Pakistan. Literally starving, no resources. And his lieutenants were basically, they just wanted resources. Uh, and here you have Ayman Zawahiri. The reason why I'm focusing on Ayman Zawahiri because Ayman Zawahiri played a key role in this particular tactical shift that took place between 1996 and 1998. He faced a stark choice. Should he go the same way that the bulk of the local jihadists did, basically declare a unilateral ceasefire or basically find, construct a new device in order to basically rescue the sinking near enemy ship that was indeed sinking by 1997. Uh, the new shift, of course, would bring Ayman Zawahiri under the Osama bin Laden tent. <coughs> Osama bin Laden was then in Afghanistan, and remember Osama bin Laden had a great deal of resources and fighters. So Ayman Zawahiri was starving for resources, and plus al-Jihad faction was almost decimated by 1997. So the shift to the global jihad would bring Ayman Zawahiri resources and even fighters to remain uh, in business. When in the late 1990s, Zawahiri's proposed the, this particular shift, there was an internal revolt within the al-Jihad faction. Some of the lieutenants I interviewed in Yemen and Algeria and Egypt basically believed that Ayman Zawahiri was very reckless, very suicidal. The idea was, the, the statement was, well, look, if we could not take on the near enemy, how could we take on the sole surviving superpower that is very uh, reckless and very uh, suicidal? Uh, in heated memos uh, to Zawahiri, his top lieutenants, and I'm not saying anything original here, this is part of the record now, not only the interviews we have and the memos, the captured documents that we have now, I mean, that uh, multiple sources, uh, so I'm not, I'm not just basically constructing a particular thesis here. This is part of the record. In, in heated memos between Ayman Zawahiri's lieutenants and Ayman Zawahiri, they made, they made it very clear that that was not the way to go. In fact, they argued that Osama bin Laden was an amateur, a naive person, a self-promoter. Don't go that way. Very blunt language. I'm not just talking about one. I'm talking about a critical mass of the leadership of jihad and al gamal al-Islamiyya. The reason why I'm focusing a bit on those groups, I mean, I said at the height of its power, Al-Qaeda never numbered more than three or 4,000 fighters. Egyptian Islamic Jihad and the Islamic group numbered around 100,000 fighters in the late 1990s. So we're talking about, this is not just a theoretical question, uh, that is, it's a critical question to how the jihadist movement decided to uh, basically construct its narrative and whether to wage, uh, uh, to continue to wage the jihad or uh, declare a uh, uh, unilateral uh, ceasefire. Zawahiri exp expounded his particular argument when there was an internal revolt. Again, in internal memos, Zawahiri said, listen, we have no choice. The only way that we could survive is that by basically attacking what he called the head of the snake that is the United States of America. And he said, in memos after memo, he said, once we attack the head of the snake, the United States would likely lash out angrily against the Muslim Ummah. And once the United States lash out against the Muslim Ummah, we would stand up and defend the Muslim Ummah, and thus we would gain credibility in the eyes of Muslim public opinion. I think he was absolutely correct, because the reason why local jihadis like Ayman Zawahiri lost the battle by the end of the 1990s because the jihadist current basically did not succeed in creating a viable social base in the Muslim world. While a majority of Muslims basically looked at their own government as being authoritarian and oppressive, they realized that Ayman Zawahiri and his associates did not really provide any vision, did not really provide any way out of the uh, badly embraced. So even though Ayman Zawahiri passionately made the, arg the argument, basically there were very few takers. In fact, in a meeting in 1999 at the Shura Council in Afghanistan, uh, Ayman Zawahiri was forced to resign as the Amir of al-Jihad because he came under tremendous pressure by even those lieutenants who were present 
in Afghanistan itself. Uh, Why, why do I, I mean, why do I burden you with all these details? Uh, I mean, this is history, you might say. Two points. Again, to reiterate my major point, there has never been a critical, viable, social base of support for the global jihad, even, even within the jihadist current itself. The bulk of the near enemy jihadists not only did not join the global jihad, but in fact stayed on the sidelines and were vehemently critical of the global jihad proposed by Ayman Zawahiri and by uh, uh, Osama bin Laden. The second point, and this is very relevant to us as students of international relations and international history, that is both Ayman Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden are not interested in defeating the United States and Britain. We know this is, they're not as stupid as that. They are basically interested in toppling the existing pro-Western secular regimes and establishing authentic states, authentic uh, Islamic Emirates. They are status to the core. The big prize on the table is not defeating the United States, but rather capturing the state itself. And this is very critical to our assessment of the nature of the threat, whether the global jihadists, whether the United States and the Western audience where the primary audience or whether Muslim public opinion was the primary audience. This is, and I, I know I'm simplifying a great deal, this is in relation to what I call the jihadi current. I don't call it a movement because it's not really a movement. I call it a current. We can talk about social movements in a minute. I'm really not interested in Al-Qaeda. I have never been interested in Al-Qaeda. I came to Al-Qaeda by accident because I'm interested in social movements in Arab and Muslim politics, and Al-Qaeda in a way is a mutation of, of a, the radical uh, Islamist movement uh, in the Middle East. Uh, how about the Taliban, you might say? Didn't the Taliban basically coalesce with Al-Qaeda and represent a threat to the West? Although the Taliban in Afghanistan provided shelter to Ayman Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden, the Taliban in the 1990s opposed basically the use of Afghanistan as the staging ground for basically plotting attack, attacks against the United States and Saudi Arabia. This might come as a surprise to you. This might come as a surprise to you. In fact, in a meeting of the Shura Council of the Taliban in 1999, a majority of the Shura Council of the Taliban decided either to expel Osama bin Laden, Ayman Zawahiri from Afghanistan or to kill Ayman Zawahiri and Usam, a majority, a majority of the Taliban Shura Council in 1999 believed that Usama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri were harming the very interests of the Taliban Emirates by basically alienating both the United States and Saudi Arabia. Uh, in fact, in fact, it was Mullah Omar who vetoed the dominant, the majority decision by the Shura Council but yet, at the same time, Mullah Omar warned Osama bin Laden publicly that he is not to give media interviews to Western media outlets and not to use Afghanistan as the staging ground for attacks against either Saudi Arabia or uh, the United States. Well, of course, we know that Osama bin Laden, uh, uh, basically, uh, for Mullah Omar was no match for Osama bin Laden. And we know that Osama bin Laden uh, stabbed his, his, his host in the back. And many of the Taliban leaders never have never forgiven Osama bin Laden for basically stabbing his host in the back. The point I'm trying to make here is that uh, the Taliban, regardless of what you think of this reactionary, ultra-conservative movement, they have never called, they have never called or advocated the global jihad. The United States has never claimed that the Taliban either waged or even carried out a global jihad uh, attack against either the United States, even though they recklessly entrapped themselves in Al-Qaeda's transnational uh, designs. To summarize, with the exception of Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda had very few assets. Al-Qaeda had very few assets 
Um, and more significantly, as I suggested earlier, there existed no viable constituency for the global jihad in the Muslim world. And as we, as you know, hardly any Al-Qaeda global jihad assets in Iraq today. That is, on the morning uh, after 9-11. The analytical and conceptual challenge facing the US after 9-11, you'll see why I'm, I'm focusing on all this details, because it uh, was to delineate the nature of the threat. That was the question on the table. What kind of threat did the United States and its allies face after 9-11? Did the global jihad represent a strategic existential threat to the United States of America and its Western allies, or was it just a security nuisance? Bad as it is, dangerous as it was, 3,000, 4,000 fighters do not really correspond to other strategic threat or even existential threat. That was the question on the table, and there was a big debate. No one can say that there was no debate in the United States. We barked for, for, for months and for years about, so there was basically a debate, and there were some analytical questions basically considered in the United States. Was Al-Qaeda part of a broader ideological coalition challenging the West and the United States, or a fringe social movement? A fringe, not even movement, a fringe social current, uh, a product of what I call a deepening structural institutional crisis in the Muslim world. Of course, not just institutional crisis coupled with misguided Western foreign policy. I mean, let's remember, we talk about Osama bin Laden in a vacuum of American foreign policy and Western foreign policies. Up to 1990, 1991, Osama bin Laden was the contact man between the Saudi security forces and the Pakistani security forces. Osama bin Laden, and it's fair to say, basically was in the same tranches as the United States of America and its allies in Afghanistan. It was in 1991 when Osama bin Laden basically left Saudi Arabia very upset and angry over the deployment of American forces in the Gulf War in 1990, 1991, and the stationing of American troops in Saudi Arabia uh, itself. Did bin Laden, again part of the question, did bin Laden and Osama bin Laden, uh, bin Laden and Zawahiri speak for the Muslim world? Was there a constituency for the global jihad? Did even Osama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri speak for all jihadists, for mainstream Islamists, for even the politically radicalized religious activists? If my reading is correct, not only Osama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri did not speak for the Muslim world, they did not even speak for the local jihadi current that numbered more than 100,000 fighters. In fact, most of them did not really accept or join the migration from the local jihad into the global jihad. What I'm trying to say here is that American officials, in particular American officials and some of their British counterparts, miscalculated monstrously uh, uh, and analytically about the nature of the threat. I'm not talking about intentions. That's a different question. We can talk about all I'm suggesting at this, all I am claiming is that there was a catastrophic analytical misreading of the threat faced by the United States. I'm not talking about all kinds of rhetorical, ideological question. That's a different question we can talk about. Uh, for sure, one thing for sure is that, in fact, the global war on terror has produced the opposite results from the intended, intended consequences. And I want to say a few words about the effects of the global war. And that's why, because I think, to my mind, the last nine, 10 years are very critical to understanding why the Middle East is broken and what has happened in the, in the last uh, 10 years late, almost 10 years late. Surely, a few years ago, I mean, we can, we can agree that the three, 4,000 fighters that existed on the morning of 9-11 of, of, uh, paled by comparison with the nature of the threat faced by the United States and its allies today. I don't know about you. I'll take any time the three, 4,000 fighters of Al-Qaeda as opposed to the rise of a new Taliban movement in Pakistan and the U.S. waging war in Pakistan. This is a nu nuclear armed power, uh, which is suffering from social and political instability and even bankruptcy. What I'm suggesting, here you have on 9-11, the United States facing 3,000, 4,000 Al-Qaeda fighters concentrated in, in Afghanistan. Now the United States is facing the remnants of Al-Qaeda, 
We're talking about between 300 and 500 fighters left of Al-Qaeda Central. But the United States is facing now two viable social movements, both in Afghanistan and Pakistan, with critical security repercussions to the region and uh, Western uh, interest uh, as well. Let's talk a bit about, and I'm, again, I'm simplifying a great, uh, a great deal here. I mean, it's uh, democracy promotion in Iraq itself. This is part of the, again, of the facts of, of, uh, of the global war on terror. Democracy promotion in Iraq has turned into a farce, uh, a nightmare, with an entrenched sectarian system basically constructed in the heart uh, of a... I would argue that Iraq today that is, six years after the American-led invasion occupation of Iraq, is one of the most dangerous countries in the world, as dangerous, if not more so, than Afghanistan itself. Iraq today is as dangerous, if not more so, than Afghanistan. You have multiple fault lines, multiple fault lines, ideological, sectarian, political, that could easily plunge Iraq into all-out war. And I think the jury is still out. And we know how bad the situation in Iraq. In fact, it, it, it is terrifying to visit Iraq. I would challenge anyone to walk in the streets of Baghdad anywhere. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a nightmare. I would walk, much easier to walk in Kabul than, than uh, Baghdad itself. Of course, uh, not talking about, I mean, the, 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 the costs, the human costs. Uh, I mean, this is, this is a different situation. There's a different, regardless of what you think, it's 100,000, 200,000, 500,000, 1 million Iraqi casualties, and the cost both in blood and treasure. But Iraq today has neither security nor stability. In, in fact, Iraq stands on the brink, could easily plunge into all-out war, given the multiple, uh, uh, I mean, nature of the, uh, of the crisis. Uh, and what, 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 the, what the invasion occupation of Iraq has done is that basically it has opened the floodgates of sectarianism. It has opened the floodgates of sectarianism from the Gulf to Lebanon to the historically non-sectarian Middle Eastern societies like Yemen and Egypt. Whoever believed that basically Yemen and Egypt would be gripped by sectarianism, and this is a direct result of the conflict that has been, uh, has been raging in Iraq uh, for the last uh, six years. <coughs> Iran. Equally, I mean, designed the global war on terror to emasculate Iran, uh, but by canceling its two uh, rival, historical rivals, Saddam Hussein of Iraq and the hyper-Taliban regime in Afghanistan, I think it's fair to say that Iran now is the unrivaled regional superpower in the Gulf. And yes, Iran is facing some major internal, a major internal crisis, and has slowed down its power drive but I think Iran now has emerged as a key player challenging the U.S.-led alliance, not just in the heart of the Gulf, but even in the eastern part of the Arab world. In fact, I would argue Iran has gained some major public opinion in usually Sunni-based states. Here you have, I mean, Shiite Iran <laughs> gaining public support in some of, because Iran is seen to be the vanguard, the spearhead of opposition to the American-Israeli um, alliance. Here you have Al-Qaeda, originally concentrated mainly in Afghanistan. Now you have multiple Al-Qaeda, I mean, tactics and, and ideas and ideologies migrating to many parts of the world, uh, including Iraq, including Yemen, uh, Palestinian refugee camps, uh, Somalia. Um, and in this particular sense, I would argue that the global war on terror was a gift to the global the, uh, jihad French. Because the idea is now the global jihad fringe, as Ayman Zawahi said in 1999, once the, once the United States lashes out angrily against the Ummah, we would basically stand up and defend the Ummah and gain credibility in the eyes of Muslim public opinion. And the message, and the message that basically uh, of Ayman Zawahi and Osama bin Laden, even though most Muslims, the overwhelming majority of Muslims, do not really buy, do not agree with his tactics, the message itself that basically Western boots in the heart of Islam and that the Western powers are trying to dominate and subjugate the Islamic world 
resonate and resonate widely in that part of the world. In this sense, I would argue the expansion of the war on terror uh, deepened the structural crisis also of pro-Western uh, Arab and Muslim uh, rulers as well. Because here you have what, what Ayman Zawahi and Osama bin Laden have been saying, uh, you have Arab and Muslim ru rulers are basically are in cahoots with the Western powers. They are impotent, they are incapable of defending the Ummah, while we are the vanguard, the spearhead of the uh, Ummah. <clears throat> I, I said a great deal about the, 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 the catastrophic uh, judgments made by Washington. I think uh, the, the, the Bush administration was correct on one particular point. Uh, it was correct that his authoritarianism and extremism were the roots, basically, of the mutations that we have seen in the region. That the reality is the global jihad itself and the local jihad is a product of the deepening institutional crisis in the region. What do I mean? I keep saying the deepening institutional crisis in the region. I mean, uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about here is that what I call a vacuum of legitimate political authority. A vacuum of legitimate political authority. That is, uh, 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 most Arabs and Muslims view their government as illegitimate. There is a huge vacuum of legitimate political authority, and Osama bin Laden, Ayman Zawahi, and their pre predecessors, they're trying to fill this particular huge vacuum uh, of authority by offering an alternative, an alternative based on the politics of identity and authenticity. That is, Islam is part of the politics of identity and uh, authenticity. <clears throat> and I think in this particular sense, forced democratization, regardless if it's genuine or not. I'm, I'm not again, I'm not going to make any I mean, big statements about whether Bush meant uh, what he said about democratization. But we know democratization, forced dem democratization in a part of the world does not work for two particularly simple reasons. Historically um, and theoretically uh, as well. Again, um, I don't need to tell you that Western military intervention uh, uh, in Muslim lands uh, basically reminds Arabs and Muslims of uh, colonialism. You have, I mean, collective historical memory of Western colonialism. And having Western boots on the ground basically is bound to remind Muslims of that ugly particular moment in their history and basically convince them that the West is trying to dominate uh, and subjugate their lands and siphon their resources. And also, democratization, uh, whether forced or not, and again, this is common sense cliche, uh, requires a great deal of time, of resources, of investment, of cultural capital, and all, I'm afraid to say, where and are in short supply in Washington. Um, you know, we know what it takes to uh, help basically uh, uh, build a viable, uh, genuine, uh, democratic uh, uh, experiment. The task is, I mean, the task was and is how to rebuild failed and failing institutions of political governance and political economy. That was the question on 9-11, and that's still the question uh, today. That is, failing and failed institutions of political governance and uh, economic governance uh, as well. Uh, I don't think I'm exaggerating. The modern Middle East today is an institutional wasteland. I mean, just look around. It really is wasteland. We talk about Yemen. Uh, Yemen is not the exception. Uh, Yemen is the norm, the rule uh, in the Middle East uh, today. And again, to come back to the question, and that's why this huge vacuum of legitimate political authority gives, I mean, uh, birth to mutations like both the local jihad and the uh, global jihad. Uh, I don't want to talk here about the types of regimes that exist um, in the Middle East itself. I don't want to bore you with all the details about, you know, what exists in the modern Middle East uh, today. Uh, in fact, I would go further and say we need new concepts and terms to really understand what has happened in the region in the last uh, 20 and 30 and 40 years, and also to understand how the global war on terror itself deepened and widened this what I call the huge vacuum of political authority that exists in the region. 
Uh, I mean, think about it. When we talk about transition in Latin America and other places, we talk about transition from one party system to multi-party systems to liberal democracies, what have you. That's what, 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 when we talk about transition. What do we talk about transition when we talk about the Middle East itself? We talk about transition from one party, authoritarian states, to family-based states, hereditary state. That is the question in the Middle East today. It's not whether the one-party system, the authoritarian state, is evolving into other semi-democratic construct or illiberal democracy, but rather you have now in the Middle East that those same authoritarian Dawlat al-Mukhabara, the security state now, has devolved into a hereditary family-owned states. They're not the longer states in the region. And the goal, the basic goal, this particular family-based state, the hereditary state, is to promote the interest of al hashia the family, the family itself and the people around it. That is, we think of the state in the Viberian sense, basically a centralized authority, basically whose monopoly on the use of force, its basic goal is to provide security for civil society and also equality before the law. In the Middle East, what do we have in the Middle East today? We have a state that promotes the interests, has of course monopoly on the use of force, but the interest of just the family and al hashia itself. And of course, to suppress any kind of legitimate collective opposition. You can, you can bark and scream as long as you're not part of any kind of collective. How much time do I have? Um, up to you. <laughs> uh, but I think we'd want to leave some time for questions. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, least, I would say, yeah, I would What's say uh, another 15 minutes. Then? Okay. Yeah. I mean, look at, and I'm not talking about, I mean, people talk, Yemen is a failing state. Is it a failed state, a failing state? Yemen, is, 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 the, is that the case to talk about? Uh, I mean, you have the Mubarak family, you have the Assad family, you have the Qaddafi family, you have the Ali Abdullah family, the family states, those same vanguard, revolutionary, one-party state of the 1950s and 60s now, are family-based states. And we have really, we're dealing, that's why we need new concepts to understand what has happened in that bloody part of the world. And of course, those family-based states, they no longer even struggle or even labor to get legitimacy. They basically, obedience is the name of the game. That is, they're using the really brute power in order to suppress the population and basically, and in a way, they have succeeded to a large Extent. And that's why I would argue, uh, at this particular moment, and uh, I'm sorry for upsetting s some of my liberal and leftist friends here, it's fair to say that intolerance and extremism, net tolerance and inclusiveness are a dominant feature of Arab and Muslim politics. Intolerance and exclusion, net tolerance, and this is not that part of any cultural uh, traits here. Uh, you're talking about those prolonged authoritarianism, failed economic policies, a sense of despair that have bled Arab and Muslim societies dry. No wonder why the sense of intolerance and, and with multiple levels. I wish we had the time to talk about examples of how intolerance is basically manifesting itself in that part of the world. We've been talking about the institutional crisis, but the institutional crisis by itself does not really tell the whole story because you have also a grave social and economic crisis. Question what I call the bread and butter in the Middle East. And again, Numbers and statistics don't tell the whole story. I mean, you really have to visit the region. And I'm not talking about, remember when I say family-based estates, I'm not referring to the Gulf here. In fact, I would argue that the Gulf regimes have more legitimacy because, I mean, they don't pretend to be revolutionary. They don't pretend to be inclusive. They don't pretend to be secular. They don't pretend to be a vanguard for anything. They are basically monarchies. Let's give them a break. I mean, the truth. No, 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 seriously. We're talking about, we're talking about the so-called secular, vanguard, authoritarian, revolutionary spearhead of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, in, in a way, I think it's fair to say 
that the Gulf monarchies are seen to be much more legitimate now than the, the so-called the secular state that exists exist in that uh, part of the world. I just want to, statistics are very misleading. You know this, I mean, you, I just want to just give you a glance of what I'm talking about, the region, talk about the sense of despair, and I'm, I'm, I, I hope I don't bore you with the numbers. 40% of the 300 million Arabs live either in poverty or below the poverty line, 40%. And this is, at, uh, it's probably 43%. Uh, uh, in fact, over half the population of Iraq and Sudan and Palestine and Yemen live either in poverty or below the poverty line. Over half of the population in Iraq, whoever believed it, and Iraq is the wealthiest state, supposedly to be the wealthiest states in that part of the world. 30%. Um, and employment among youth between the ages 30 years old, 20 years old, 30%. In Yemen, it's 58%, the unemployment, the highest in the world, the highest in the world, I mean, the 58%. And remember, young people, unemployed young people, this is a big problem because it's, it's I don't need to tell you um, why it's a big problem. Here you have Lebanon, one of the most open societies. 40% of the Lebanese people live either in poverty or below the poverty line. Go see the urban poverty belts in Tripoli and Saida and Beirut. This tells you about, and not just poverty, a sense of despair, also authoritarianism, the lack of political avenues for political uh, expression. And I think it's this combination of institutional, the deepening structural institutional crisis and the gravity of the social and economic crisis that's a recipe uh, for disaster in the future. In fact, and I, I, Truly, I am so pleasantly surprised by how little violence that exists in that part of the world. I mean, think about it. I mean, here you have, if you, if you visit those urban poverty belts, in fact, even in comparative historical terms, in comparative historical terms, contrary to what Thomas Friedman says in his anecdotal, uh, is that the Middle East is one of the least violent systems in the international system, given the multiple, I mean, the, the, the nature of, of, of the crisis. Uh, and that's why, I mean, it's this combination of the institutional crisis and the social crisis. To me, that's why I keep saying that the Middle East is broken, literally uh, broken. Uh, uh, again, we talk about Yemen as, we had a, a discussion on Yemen yesterday, as whether Yemen is, I, to my mind, Yemen is not uh, uh, the place to start. Let's start with the most pivotal state in the Arab Middle East. Let's start with Egypt. Egypt is the most populous Arab state, 82 million people. Egypt used to be and is, you might say, the, 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 the cultural capital of the Arab world. It was. Not anymore, but, but it was. Egypt really, in a way, you can see the Arab mirror uh, condition through the Egyptian uh, uh, situation. Uh, again, 43.9% of Egyptians live in poverty. Uh, in 1923, and I, I, I can't, I mean, this is, I, I come back to it, Jill, time and again. In 1923, Egypt had one of the most progressive constitutions in the world, not just in the Middle East and the developing world. As progressive as the United States, the 1923 constitution under British colonialism, the most progressive constitution in the world. I mean, this is it's unbelievable. Look at Egypt today. Nothing works in Egypt. I mean, literally nothing except the security forces. And not only because the security apparatus is effective or rational, because of the sheer numbers of millions of, 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 of men poorly armed and fed and dressed. It's just you have millions of security all over the place. That's why it works. Millions of Egyptians, I mean, just go to Cairo every place, wait for hours to get six loaves of subsidized bread. Millions that Egypt cannot, you know, Egyptians refer to their country as Umid Dunya, the mother of the world. It is the mother of the world. It's one of the oldest nation states in the world. Yet it cannot feed its people. I mean, here you have one of the countries, one of the thickest institutions. If there's one country, we can say, this is Egypt. Institutional wasteland. I mean, hardly any institutions. President Mubarak has been in power for 29 years. Reportedly, he's grooming his son, Gamal, to succeed reportedly. This tells you about, I mean, and I came to talk about Western policies because I don't have the time. Here, my own president, Barack Obama, embracing President Mubarak and saying he is our friend 
a, 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 a force for stability and wisdom. We turn to President Mubarak in hard times. That's what Barack Obama said uh, when uh, President Mubarak visited uh, Washington. There is not even a single party in Egypt, with the exception of the Muslim Brotherhood, that basically can really mobilize more than two, 3,000 men and women on the streets to protest this situation. I mean, this is, this is what we're talking about, political apathy and fear of security forces. Compare the Arab world to, to Iran. Say, what have you about Iran? Iran is a vibrant society. You have hundreds of thousands of Iranians who would go on the streets and protest. In the Arab world, Egypt, as a case study, you, ca you cannot have a few thousand men and women on the streets because both political apathy, devastation of civil society, and the security apparatus itself. Where do we go from here? I mean, I, 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 that's not, we don't have the time to talk about, this is not about policy. Where, I mean, I am afraid <coughs> whatever policy prescriptions we suggest, they have consequences. I mean, this is, I mean, common sense. Uh, whatever you say, you have consequences and you have to live with the consequences. I mean, I wish, as, as a student of the region, I wish that the region itself can be left to its own devices. I wish that politics could basically play its own course. Let politics play its own course and see how the region develops. But we know this is not going to happen. This is wishful thinking. I mean, this is, this is the reality. Uh, and I, I, again, I'm not saying anything original that the Middle East is, is much more embroiled in great power politics than any region in the world. Uh, the making, the very making of the modern Middle East is a colonial construction. The term itself, the boundaries, the borders, everything, it's a colonial construction. Uh, the great powers, the Western powers, and now, of course, China and India, addicted to Middle Eastern oils, 60% of which is located in that part of the world. So not only you have the Western powers, now China, look what's happening in terms of the Iranian diplomacy now. China is, because of China, is the, the third uh, purchaser of, of Iranian oil. And that's why China is unwilling to go with the Western alliance vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Iran. Not just in terms of oil, you have the Palestine-Israel conflict that resonates deeply with the Muslim community, the Muslim ummah, and critical segments of Western public opinion, because it's an identity issue for many Westerners. And for the overwhelming majority of Arabs and Muslims, this is really an identity issue. And that's why, I mean, the Middle East will not be left to its own uh, devices. And now, of course, we add the politically based violence, the question of terrorism and, and nuclear weapons, and you can imagine why the great powers uh, will basically let politics uh, play uh, its course. And I think uh, I want to conclude on, on is that President Barack Obama has already made his preferences very clear. Make, as the Americans say, make no doubts about it. He won't preach. He won't preach, in his own words, to other nations about democracy and human rights. He has said it so many times. And translation, basically realism, is back with vengeance in American foreign policy. Uh, that's the reality. I'm not saying that W. Bush was not a realist, but at least the rhetoric of, uh, and, and some of the policies had kind of, you know, uh, a different uh, texture. And of course, this is a very welcome development for the bloody dictators. Uh, because now they are more than willing to partner. I mean, look at the Yemeni president, Ali Abdullah Saleh. Now Al-Qaeda is a big thing for him. I mean, this is in a way, it allows him to dance on the heads of the snakes, as he said. Because money from the American support, it allows him to, I mean, remain in power after 31 years. And I can bet you the Pakistanis and other powers would uh, more than happy. And they would also perform functions. I mean, Egypt now, here you have Egypt, one of the, well, the most important Arab state, performs services to Washington. Not just in terms of the war on terror, but also in terms of keeping uh, Hamas and the Czech, and basically uh, uh, keeping Abbas alive. Uh, Egypt now role is basically, has been reduced to performing services for Washington. Again, it tells you about, because they'll do whatever it takes to remain uh, in power. Uh, so I think it seems to me more of the same for the next seven years, in particular if Barack Obama is elected, and I hope he's elected, and 
you know, bearing a, 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 the economy. What I'm suggesting is that uh, at the end of the day, uh, I don't think we're going to see any new policies on the part of Washington. Whether on the peace process, we know that the peace, I mean, Obama's peace initiative has reached a deadlock now, it? for a variety of reasons. We can talk about it. Um, and here I hope, and again, this could be wishful thinking, that Europe itself will step, step, uh, step up to fill, to compensate for the moral and political failure of American leadership. That really is moral and political failure. And, and I mean, you might, you might, you might, I mean, think I am, I am out of. I, this is very serious. I mean, it's very serious. And let me just put some ideas on the table, and, and I'll end here. Why Europe? Really, it's essential for Europe to fill this particular vacuum, the moral and 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 political vacuum that the United States has, has basically uh, created in that part of the world. Europe is more equipped, better positioned, historically, by temperament and geograph geographically to deal with that part of the world. Uh, and also, I think, to deactivate the cultural minefield, minefields that exist between the world of Islam and the West. Uh, I mean, I think, in a sense, Europe could really construct a, a blueprint for a two-state solution. It's not just to say we believe in a two-state solution as the Americans say. I want, to see, I want to see a blueprint about the borders, about the nature of the two states. And I think Europe could help Barack Obama in this particular sense, like this is the blueprint, a secure, a secure Israeli state and a viable, secure Palestinian state um, on the West Bank in Gaza with its capital in East Jerusalem. I don't think we're asking too much if the political will exists and if Europe has. Uh, Europe could make structural investments, unlike the Americans. I mean, what we have spent, as you know, I, I talked about the, the global war on terror. We have spent, Howard, in direct costs, $1 trillion so far on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. In indirect costs, the argument goes into $2 through $1 trillion. And we have spent the homeland security $1, uh, $1, $1 trillion as well. I mean, $2 trillion in direct costs on the global war on terror. Imagine, just imagine. Uh, and that's why I think, in this particular sense, I would like Europe here to invest in, in a structural uh, investment in education, in environment, in education uh, in that part of the world. Because I think uh, the reason why I don't believe this is wishful thinking, because in the end, whatever happens, in the Middle East, if our, correct, if our reading is correct, if the situation is really desperate, if there is a high potential for urban violence, and given the, the, the closeness of the Middle East and the Mediterranean to Europe, I would argue that Europe will be much more affected by any development, negative development, in the Middle East and Mediterranean than uh, North America. And in this, in this particular sense, I would argue for Europe, the stakes are much more higher than the United States of America. Thank you. I want to stop here. Well, thank you very much. Um, both a, a clear central thesis, but also uh, lots of fascinating um, byways as we as we went through it, um, ending with uh, a strong plea for a European role. Now, the cynic might say that if the answer is Cathy Ashton, the question is a rather peculiar one. Um, but uh, that's just a cynical um, uh, observation. Yeah. But nonetheless, uh, I think it does raise a serious point about whether Europe is equipped um, to play a more active role uh, in the Middle East. But let, let me sort of leave that question, because I don't want to uh, get in the way of questions from elsewhere, from the audience. And I'm already seeing hands, a lot of hands. Right. Uh, should we take two or three and then uh, yeah. and see how we go? Take the man on the front row straight away. Thanks. Wait for the microphone. Say who you are, and off you go. Hi, um, Rob Lichten, uh, WAC Media. Um, has the decade been wasted if one wished to further de destabilize the Middle East, create an invisible enemy and a never-ending war which justifies endless Western legislation, rapid expansion of the military-industrial complex and intelligence services? Thank you. 
Now, there was someone, yeah, just four rows back. Thanks. Uh, Peter Wilson, Department of International Relations, London School of Economics. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> with, the regard, with regard to the decision in Washington to launch the war on terror, there are, of course, a lot of intelligent and knowledgeable people in the foreign policy community in Washington, let alone the broader international relations community. Given that, what explains this decision to launch this catastrophic policy? What, what dynamical factors do you think explain it? We'll take, there was one more just uh, here, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, that's right. Ma the man in the sort of stripy shirt, yeah. Uh, my name is Edwin Dweck. I'm a retired administrator. I would like to know how you could reconcile uh, the fact that Europe could play such an important uh, part in the Middle East, uh, especially in view that uh, both uh, Britain and France were the colonial powers who uh, carved up the Middle East. <laughs> right. So we, um, we have, was this a conspiracy? We have... Yeah. What about all these smart people in America? Why didn't they do something? And we have Sykes Pico over here. Yes, we have right? great questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I said, I'll start with the last question I yeah. said earlier. All really policy prescriptions have consequences. And probably more Western intervention would invite the accusation is that somehow the West is trying to make the region in its own image and, and on and on. But I, 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 I'm not talking about, I'm talking about really structural investment in terms of, it does not have to be government to government. Here now we have the European Union, we have multiple uh, institutions and agencies. I would like European institutions really to have a kind of a, you might say, a comprehensive, uh, a grand vision, uh, which takes, and, and there are some ideas on the table. It's not like we're, uh, and I, I really, I, I'm talking about environment, the environment, I'm talking about uh, uh, education. I mean, I, when, when we say, because I, I, I've spoken in terms of very abstract, uh, the institutional crisis can actually be comprehended without understanding the dismal nature of the educational system. Uh, I mean, again, we, we, and this is where there are no magical wands in, in this sense. I'm talking about the long-term uh, process whereby uh, at least we, we stop the deterioration of the situation because it, it, if it's true that uh, you have a grave social and economic crisis coupled with a deepening institutional crisis, uh, uh, the situation is very disastrous. And I think given the fact that Europe has much more to lose and given the fact that just about in terms of humanitarianism and, and international community and society, I think it would be wonderful to conceptualize and, and begin to think of some options to deal with those long term. But yes, you're absolutely correct. I mean, by saying so, uh, you're also, you will have consequences and you'll have outcries. Some, some certain groups in the Middle East that Europe is back at the game again. In terms of, I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, that's in every single, I mean, um, uh, really event, that's the same question comes in, is that uh, the question of conspiracy, the question that somehow uh, the neoconservatives in the United States, uh, you know, evildoers, they really wanted to, uh, uh, basically, the whole idea of chaos, they wanted to create chaos. I mean. Um, and, and chaos that serves the interest of, uh, I mean, the, the, the empire, that the empire will basically be able to dominate the region. I, I just, it, it, is, it is too simplistic. I mean, uh, it's just, I, I, I mean, given the fact I work on an area where conspiracy theories abound, I am I'm allergic to conspiracy theories. I mean, I, I really, no, I really I am. I mean, it's, and I, I want you to know that uh, we have to really question our own premises on that. I mean, I, but I see where you're going with it. And I see, I mean, I, I, some of us walk in the Middle East. I mean, you go, you speak to intelligent people, civil society leaders, editors of top newspapers. They look you straight in the eyes and they say, Al-Qaeda will never, can never carry out suicide bombings in Iraq against other Muslims. This is all, I mean, I'm talking about across the board. It's all the Mossad and the American forces. They really believe it. I mean, this is, I mean, it, it is so, it, it's, so that's why I'm saying that probably we should really search for other explanations. Uh, and this brings me to, I mean, Peter's question about, uh, yes, I mean, uh, I think
think they are great intellectual uh, resources, and uh, I'm not disputing that at all. Uh, and that's why I said that this was a, a catastrophic analytical uh, uh, decision. And I think at the end of the day, and I, I don't know whether, I mean, I might be wrong, I think when the history of this particular period is written, it's not why, why the United States really invaded Iraq. I, I think this is, the story is coming out. I think the question is why the American systems, checks and balances failed and failed dismally after 9-11. But here you have some of the great institutions basically, I mean, telling, you know, W. Bush you're in charge and the small group of foreign policy, brilliant but uh, ideologically inclined to hijack American foreign policy. And to really, the whole notion of wiping the slate clean was basically, was on the, mo I mean, five minutes after basically 9-11, it was Rumsfeld who articulated the notion that this is a new era and we must wipe the slate clean. And they, they basically bought their own rhetoric. When they were asked about social realities, was the idea was we create social realities by our own actions. Yes, we do, of course, but look what kind of social realities we have created. So I think at the end of the day, I think American historians and political scientists and, and sociologists will say, I mean, what has happened? Why the system malfunctioned after 9-11? There's a related question as to why the British Foreign Office jumped straight for that line. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I, yes, it's... Uh... <laughs> Let's leave it as a related question. Then. Let's go on this side. Uh, a man uh, sort of halfway up uh, with a blue tie. But is, is that a blue tie? Yes, it is a blue tie. Uh, my name is Nadim Shadi. I'm from Chatham House. Fawaz, it's nice to see you again. We were students together here in the early 80s. Speak up a little bit. Nadim um, and I were yeah. at the LSC in 1986 <laughs> right. yeah. together. As students. Um, Fawaz, I want to... Uh, my, my question is where would you place yourself on the spectrum between neocons and neorealists? <laughs> because you've condemned both. And I'm sorry to say that Europe is also going on a very neorealist path. So there's Excuse no me, I didn't hear you. Europe is also going on a very uh, ne neorealist path in its uh, vision of the Middle East. So wh where would you place yourself on that spectrum? Because your, your recommendations are Contradictory. neither in, <laughs> in, in neither the camp. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nadine. I'm with a cap directly behind you. Did and then Thank I'll you. take you. Adrian Sack, I'm a filmmaker and technology entrepreneur. I've noticed that the religious component, which is often said to underpin so much of this, uh, has not really been mentioned much. It seems to me that uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, Zawahiri, al Libi, they want essentially a caliphate, uh, the establishment of Sharia. That's the violent component, the hybrid that you spoke about. But then we have regimes like Saudi Arabia that are exporting Wahhabism, Sulafism, the same thing in a global context, which essentially calls for the same thing. Saudi Arabia have spent estimates 70 to 90 billion in the last 30 years exporting uh, essentially, essentially what would give rise to is Osama bin Laden's eventual aim. In what context is uh, uh, Al-Qaeda just an early precursor to what is an inevitable larger conflict? And doesn't this all sit within that inevitable, uh, much talked about clash of civilizations? Thank you, and then I'll take the third one, uh, a man with in, just by the side of the wall. Yeah, that's it. Um, your talk is based on the theory that Ayman al-Zawahiri's plan of provoking Western military intervention in Muslim lands to unite the Muslim Ummah to support the formation of a global jihadist movement actually worked and that the US and UK's motives behind the war on terror is based on protecting their security and not on promoting Western hegemony in the Middle East. For the reasons you have stated yourself regarding the threat level now faced to the West due to its aggressive foreign policy, it would have been complete lunacy to launch such a war on terror in 2001. Why do you find it so hard to accept the possibility that the observed Western foreign policy in the Middle East is actually a new kind of colonialism, colonialism and not just a mistake or a bad decision, as you suggested in your talk? Hey. Uh, uh, I, I want to start with Nadim. Uh, I, I really, uh, I, I, I would, I, I have come to believe, sadly, that uh, 
Middle Eastern dictators on their own, they will never, ever basically uh, reform. They would never, ever open up politically and integrate the rising social classes. Uh, they will never, ever give up power. Uh, and in this particular sense, uh, but I also know that any kind of force intervention by the Western powers will likely produce the opposite results from the intended consequences. Um, I would like a kind of a, a, a multilateral uh, uh, intervention by the international community uh, on societal level rather than the political level. I want to, and I probably this is again, to empower uh, society as opposed to the state and create the critical mass of liberal opinion. I know, again, this might sound very wishful thinking, but I have a vision where Middle Easterners, at the end of the day, Arabs and Muslims, are the ones who should really make, basically, uh, a grab and, and fight for their own liberties. And I want us to find ways and means to help uh, uh, create this critical mass. Uh, and I, I, you're absolutely correct. It's extremely difficult to say that uh, I want the region to be left to its own devices and then I want Europe to uh, intervene and help bring about such a critical mass. It, it is, there are no easy solutions. I, I know it's a cliche. Uh, second question about uh, colonialism. I don't think you're, you're, you're I mean, I, I think I'm glad you, uh, you, you have asked me the question. I mean, I think forced democratization, regardless of the intentions. And let's not talk, it's a form of colonialism. This is social engineering. I, I should have been much more clear in my own presentation. It doesn't matter whether he meant good or not. That is basically, and the idea was you want to social engineer. You want to create a new particular uh, uh, set of ideas that basically um, are liberal, pro-Western, secular. It's a form of, I mean, whether you call it civilization or liberalization, it's a form of colonization. Uh, I mean, that, that's what we, and probably, whether good or bad, that's not the question. But I think the United States after 9-11, and to come back to Peter's question, uh, was involved in a kind of a social engineering project to construct a, a, a new set of ideas, political ideas, uh, entirely different, radically different from the existing system. I think it's an empirically, I think your question is, and I'm glad for the correction. Uh, on the question on the clash of civilizations, I mean, we, we have basically, this is a broken record for all of us. I mean, I think one of the, I mean, implicit, one of the, I hope, one of my, my major implicit argument um, by talking about the divisions and tensions and the contradictions even within the militant camp to show that how the divisions uh, were there that is, in fact, internal divisions are as important enough, more important than the division between the West and the East. Uh, but of course, Osama bin Laden, Ayman Zawahi, would like us to believe that they speak for the Ummah. And in fact, you know, Peter, they believed him. They, the, the small group of Americans, they really took his words for granted, that Osama bin Laden became the voice, the face of, of the world of Islam. Uh, they don't. You have, and as I suggested in, in my talk all along, and I said, really, the rise of both the local and the global jihad is a mutation, is part of what I call the huge vacuum of political authority in the region. That is, that there is a struggle that has been taking place for the last 50 years. Uh, you cannot understand, I mean, the rise of al-Qaeda, except as a mutation of the local jihad, which is the local jihad took on their own government since the uh, 1950 or uh, 1950. So, no, I don't, I don't think we're talking about a clash of civilization. I think we're talking about more nuanced and, and complex situation than that. Um, and I, regardless of what you think of Osama bin Laden before 9-11, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, Osama bin Laden as, is more opposed to the, the, the monarchy now uh, than he is against the Americas. At the end of the day, again, one of my arguments is that uh, those Osama bin Laden, Ayman Zawahi, they want to capture power in their native lands. Uh, that is, uh, you, we cannot just talk about Wahhabism in a vacuum. Uh, no, I don't think there is an early alliance between Saudi Arabia and the jihadist or the Salafi uh, jihadi contingent. Regardless of the misguided policies pursued by, and, and keep in mind, I mean, Saudi Arabia was basically in the same alliance as the United States, both Saudi Arabia and the United States, 
uh, spent about $9 million during the Afghan war. So this is not just, I mean, it's a much more complex situation than just, you know, them versus us. Now, I've taken questions from the left wing and the right wing. I'm going to uh, see what I can get from the centrists here. Um, Ma'am, yeah, there. Hi, good evening. Uh, Arnold Clayton is my name. Um, it seems to me that the Middle East would be broken irrespective of any action or inaction that the United States had taken. You would still have the same corrupt, de self-serving demagogues irrespective of whether America had launched the war, and te war on terror or not. And so I'd be grateful if you'd comment on that. That's question one. And question two, if I may, if you had been asked to advise the United States following 9-11, <laughs> what would you have recommended that they do r rather than what they actually did? No. <laughs> uh, there was somebody behind, yeah, the man in the, in the middle of the bed, yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Hadi Jamaldin. I'm a lawyer. My question is that uh, you refer to a legitimate political, the vacuum of a legitimate political authority in the Middle East. I'm sorry, what was the question? You refer to a vacuum of legitimate political authority in the Middle East. Yes. My question is how are you going to fill this vacuum? One question. Um, given the fact that you said Middle East is, will never open it up. Hmm. And how are they going to uh, fill this gap? And the other question is, you referred to social engineering system. What sort of social engineering system do you propose to introduce to the Middle East? Is it going to be um, uh, imported from the West? In which case, how is it going to be compatible with the Islamic system? Thank you. Thanks. Um, there's one more. Yeah, right. So there, that's it. Yes, Arsene Chaudhary from the LSE. Um, just a point I'd like to make. I think there's a, a need for the Western public to have a deeper understanding of the issues in the Middle East without um, categorizing or stigmatizing Islam or a particular sect of Islam, such as Wahhabism for terrorism, I think there is a need to understand that what is keeping the Middle East and the Islamic world from blowing into a rage is in fact Islam itself. Um, just to have a look at the conditions some of the people are li living in, the only way um, they're surviving is because of this inherent belief in Islam that this world is temporary and this world is in, by nature um, dystopic and you can never have perfection. So I think there is a greater responsibility on the Western public to understand the resentment and the causes of those res resentment that the people have in those areas. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, again, thank you for the uh, correction. Uh, I didn't say, uh, I didn't mean to say that the global war on terror is responsible for the uh, basically institutional crisis in the Middle East. Uh, my point was the global war on terror uh, has exacerbated the institutional crisis, has enabled even though initially uh, they came under some tentative pressure to modernize and open up the political system. Uh, but what the war has done, it has really consolidated the, I mean, what, what I call the family-based estates, uh, uh, and also uh, exposed uh, the huge gap that exists between the two. Uh, and I, I, I talked about really the, 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 the I said, long-term consequences to my mind, I mean, we, we never talk about the, the historical uh, uh, damage. The war itself has reinforced widely held perceptions in the Muslim world that democracy is synonymous with aggression. Democracy is synonymous with domination. Democracy is synonymous with uh, subjugation of Muslim lands. And in, in a sense, in the long term, it has done a great deal of damage to the whole notion of a uh, liberal order. Um, no, I have no really uh, ambitions I have uh, to be, uh, because I, I, uh, policy is beyond my, even though I bark a great deal. Um, <laughs> but, but let me say what we have, I mean, again, my explicit arguments throughout, and I said we, there was a big debate, a great debate, took place in the United States. And the questions were on the table. It's not like Peter, the same intelligent, brilliant, 
uh, policymakers were not really did not have, I mean, access to this particular debate. Um, you could have said, looked at Al Qaeda, are they part of a broader coalition, strategic existential threat, as the new policy, uh, basically apparatus conceived of Al Qaeda, or Al Qaeda as a fringe, dangerous, insidious, uh, but just a security nuisance. I'm not suggesting that Al Qaeda was not and is not dangerous. All I am suggesting is that from any angle you look at it, Al Qaeda is a fringe, is a security uh, nuisance. Is, I mean, this is simple stuff. I mean, I, but, but to give you an idea how difficult it is to really understand what I call the inability of the American political establishment to really break free from this particular mentalité. Or, or a few days ago on Sunday, Hillary Clinton, our Secretary of State, was asked about which is really much more dangerous strategically, a nuclear-armed Iran or Al-Qaeda? On television, on ABC television. This is one of the most intelligent American. She said, we believe that Al-Qaeda threat basically is much more strategic and existential to the nation than a nuclear-armed Iran, quote, unquote. I mean, Al-Qaeda was, it's one thing to say in 19, 2001, Al-Qaeda today is down, according to all estimates, including I'm talking about US intelligence estimates and European intelligence estimates, is between 300 and 500 operatives. Those are the central Al-Qaeda. They're basically concentrated in Waziristan, uh, basically. Uh, you have fewer than 100 Al-Qaeda members in Afghanistan, between 50 and 100, but you're talking about 300 in Pakistan. Uh, this is Hillary Clinton. I mean, and, and to, because at the end of the day, at the end of the day to come is that there is a particular narrative. I mean, as, as I mean, Americans now terrorize themselves. The idea is you have it. No, no, you have a particular narrative for Hillary Clinton to say that basically Al Qaeda is more a represents a, a greater strategic threat to the United States than Al Qaeda. Uh, I'm sorry, Al Qaeda more than nuclear. It tells you there is no American politician including Barack Obama would, would dare to come before the American public and say, look, this particular war no longer makes sense. It is dangerous. I mean, I, and I, I'm going to make this nonsensical statement. If the Christmas Day bomb, bomb you know, Omar uh, Abdel Muttalib succeeded, it would have terminally, terminally undermined the Obama presidency to show you how important it is. It would have really meant the end of the Obama presidency. Because this is, I mean, it, it goes to how this particular is deeply entrenched. And American politicians cannot just deconstruct. There is no one would dare. Because the question is, what if Omar Farouk Abdel Muttalib succeeds in infiltrating the American defenses? You can imagine the consequences for American politicians. Uh, filling the, 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 the vacuum or the, the, the legitimate uh, a vacuum of legitimate political authority. Uh, I, I'm glad you asked this particular question because, again, I, I, I have spoken in terms really of abstractions here. Uh, I, the reason why, well, I mean, I, I, I wish I had the time to, I had had the time to uh, basically articulate the argument why what used to be, why the states have devolved into hereditary or family based estates. I mean, since the 1950s, the debate in that part of the world has not just between about authenticity, which is better, secular Arab nationalism or Islamism. That is, it's the question of what I call identity politics. Uh, this has been the dominant question and remains till today. Is it nationalism or is it Islamism? Uh, there is no consensus uh, uh, on this particular question. Uh, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, only Arabs and Muslims uh, will have to answer the question, what form, what form of political organization basically uh, uh, will be seen as legitimate? We cannot really answer the question for them, but this question is still on the table. I mean, almost 60 years after independence, the question has not been resolved. Uh, that is, what is a legitimate political authority? In the 1950s and 1960s and early 1970s, nationalism was the answer. Since the 1970s, Islamism is the answer. But again, whether we're talking about nationalism or Islamism, it does not provide a construct of the state itself. What kind of state we're talking about? I mean, I'm talking about theoretical questions. 
Uh, and that's why the debate itself goes round and round and round. Is it nationalism or is it uh, Islamism? That was any, any other question? Well, the other question was not really a question. It was just ah, an observation. Well, absolutely. Uh, um, yeah. Which, um, yeah, of I course, absolutely. I, you're right saying. about, I mean, demonizing. Uh, I mean, I, I think, uh, uh, yes. I mean, I, 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 I mean, look, I don't talk about Islam. I mean, we, you have to be, I mean, terms and language matter a great deal. It really do. I mean, we, we talk about uh, mainstream Islamists. We talk about militant Islamism or even uh, jihadism, about politically uh, radicalized religious activists. We are choosing our terms very carefully because, yes, absolutely, Osama bin Laden does not speak for either Islam or mainstream Islamism or Hamas or Hezbollah. Osama bin Laden speaks for a tiny fringe of the global jihad. We have to be very specific about that. And unfortunately, really, I, I mean, this particular debate has not been, I mean, fleshed out. Uh, it, it's, and because the surveys in the West, both in the United States and in Europe, uh, are very alarming. Um, a, a critical segment of Western public opinion confuses basically what's happened, that is, Osama bin Laden with the Islamic culture and Islamic religion. That's why we don't use the term Islamic, never. Because you can't talk about Islamic, we're talking about Islamist, and even Islamist is a loaded term. Uh, uh, so, yes. Um, I'm going to take a couple more because we're running really? out of time, and I, uh, I know the professors of um, international relations are on the front row well time. enough to know they get a bit panicky if they're not given a drink by 8 o'clock. So uh, the, the guy with the check, uh, the third one along, yeah. We can't have all three of you, I'm afraid. We'll have you. Two more questions. <laughs> okay, um, two more questions, yeah. The Iranian nuclear threat or the threat from Tehran uh, is a cornerstone of nearly all debates on the region at the moment. Um, I'm yet to hear a convincing thesis on what exactly that threat is, because the way I read it is, is it will threaten the order as we know it, which is a fairly pro-Western and Western-leaning um, order in the region. Um, could you please provide what you see as the threat from Iran, um, either with a weapon or on road to a weapon or without a weapon even? Thank you. Thanks. We're going to take one next to you, and that's going to be the end of it. Sorry. Okay. Um, well, this question actually follows very much on from that, uh, which is that we've, uh, we've been seeing language increasingly uh, in the debate about the region about a, the development of a regional Cold War bet potentially between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Um, I'm just wondering whether you think that is a correct analysis of the region, and if so, how significant is that for the long-term security future of it? Thank you. You've got three minutes. Yeah, well... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yes, I mean, I think you're absolutely correct. There is a very uh, a new Cold War taking place between, I mean, the so-called Sunni-based states, Saudi Arabia being, I mean, a, one of the pivotal states, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Jordan, and the Iran-led alliance, Iran and Syria, um, along with Hamas and Hezbollah. And really, in, in a way, Yemen now has become a theater. Both Saudi Arabia and Iran have become embroiled in the insurrection in Saba, an area of Yemen, that is where there's al Houthi tribes. And, it, it, it's a, and that's why I said, in a way, that the American-led invasion and occupation of Iraq has opened the floodgates of sectarianism. It is truly very alarming. Um, I mean, because as you know, there is no ideological divide, uh, theological divide between Sunnis and Shias. I mean, we're all Muslims, that's not the question, it's a political. Yet, whether Lebanon now, I mean, the next war in Lebanon is not going to be between the Muslims and Christians, unfortunately. It's going to be between the Sunnis and the Shiites. I mean, I, for some of us who know a bit about Lebanon, it's very alarming how consolidated this particular divide between Sunnis and Shiites. For Egypt, again, um, Egypt is the country where you have Al-Azhar and you have the Hussein. Al-Azhar is the Sunni. And it's next to each other. People, I mean, uh, they, they pray at Al-Azhar and they visit the Hussein in order to pay their respects. Now, Egypt and the Egyptian regime itself uses basically the Shia threat uh, in order for political mobilization. Uh, so it's very serious, and I, I'm saying it's really having serious consequences, not just in terms of inter-regional security, I'm talking about internal, that is basically is exacerbating internal uh, uh, relations, whether in Iraq, or whether in Lebanon, or whether Saudi Arabia, and Yemen, and other countries uh, as well. Well, Iran is, is 
yes, of course, the, the question now, and uh, I mean, you know uh, that I, I think we might be moving from the engagement phase to the confrontational phase. Um, and I think the Americans for the last year have been preparing for one of the most, I mean, lethal uh, set of sanctions. I mean, this is, was open secret. Uh, the, the whole idea is when I strangle the Iranian regime and you, you have top, the administration has co-opted some of the top Iranian specialists who really were um, liberal and left in order to con construct a uh, set of, of a, and I, I fear my, the question is, if the Iranian leadership comes to the conclusion that the United States and the Western Alliance uh, are trying to strangle Iran, uh, how will Iran behave? What will Iran do? Uh, what kind of, uh, and I, I just, one more minute, I, I mean, again, I, I said earlier, I, I don't wanna go into the policy, uh, but there are very alarming signs in the region today, first of all, the Obama uh, uh, peace drive has reached a deadlock you know, on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. You have the Israelis and the Syrians open threats now, both they're talking about, of course. You have the Israelis preparing for another confrontation vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah. Uh, uh, you have the Iranian now wild card. Uh, and I, I hope I am wrong, and I, I, I think I am wrong, but it seems to me uh, in the Middle East, you can't have a, 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 a things don't stand still, given the fact that uh, American diplomacy and Obama and the tremendous pressure, uh, both internally for a variety of reasons, and he does not really have the capital to really do anything in the Middle East in terms of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, and given the situation both on the Lebanese and the Palestinian borders, and given the Iranians, I think it seems to me that uh, there is the potential for all out war, uh, regional war, uh, uh, unless this particular uh, vacuum is uh, filled, and I, I fear it could be either, I mean, the spark could be a war between Israel and Hezbollah, or another incursion, another invasion of Gaza. Um, and that's why I'm saying, what will the Iranian leadership do? If, it, if I were Ahmadinejad or Khamenei sitting in, in, and knowing that they're going after me, what will I do? How can I really, uh, I mean, shuffle the cards? Uh. Thank you. Um, I think we now consider that your professorship is formally inaugurated, uh, and we may even pay you this, uh, this month, um, so I'm sure you're you. welcome. Uh, as you could see from the full house and the number of questions, the, the subjects you were picking off tonight are ones of abiding interest to a large member of, a number of the people in the LSE broader community. Uh, and we're very grateful to you for your lecture, for answering the, such a wide range of questions so fully. Um, and I think probably the best thing to do is to say same time next week. Um, we can uh, get everybody else in. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.